uh, police ex excesses. Uh, there's been disappearance, abductions, uh, illegal arrests, killings, injuries, and that sort of thing. And we haven't spent time as a country to capture exactly what has happened. What does that mean? In essence, are we saying that protesting is an illegal thing in this country? And if it's not, why did we see the reactions that we saw? Let me start with you, uh, Hussein Halid. Um, thank you very much, uh, Smart. And uh, let me first of all uh, congratulate everyone and the entire country. Comrades Power! Comrades Power! We are doing it, we are changing this country, and uh, you know, moving forward, things will never be the same. So I'll just speak briefly about my experiences on the ground as uh, you know, um, a person who has been you know, visiting families, uh, visiting the sick in hospital. I think there have been uh, gross human rights violations in the last couple of weeks. Uh, many families have suffered, continue to suffer. We have uh, an entire ward at the Kenyatta National Hospital of victims of police excesses. And that's just one hospital. We have many other hospitals in different parts, not just of Nairobi, but of the entire country that have people who are sick. Up to now, you know, we're still trying to understand the magnitude of the violations that have been meted out on Kenyans. I think in the midst of everything, we get, you know, uh, taken up by the success, the dismissal of the cabinet, the withdrawal of the finance bill, and we forget to remember that people have paid with their lives and limbs for us to be where we are today. And they must never be forgotten. Um, in uh, a number of uh, instances, some were even, you know, approached. I remember we were at the burial of David Chege, and the police officers were there. And we had just gone there to drape the coffin with the, with the flag and to give another flag to the family. And the propaganda that was going around was that uh, this is supposed to be for the K KDF only, this, uh, you know, the flagging of the coffins and everything. And they were told that if you bury your, 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 your person with the flag, the government will later come you know, to exhume and get the flag. You know, so th th there are things that are being said out there that are completely, completely out of line. And I think it's important for us, and we are discussing, to remind Kenyans that this is an opportunity. We are supposed to be extremely lucky and, you know, honored to be living in these times. Because no other generation there's been, this moment has never been there. So what we need to do is to continue encouraging each other and pushing each other forward. I think it was uh, Kindiki who said that, uh, you know, the financiers, uh, fellow criminals, power! <laughs> fellow criminals, power! <laughs> and I remember they were threatening us, oh, I don't know who the financiers, the organizers, the planners, you know, you will face the consequences. Well, guess what? Atutishiki. Sindio, nani nani ameanguka? Sindio wao ameanguka? So we are saying, you know, this is a moment. And each and every one of us can play a role. The question that we need to ask, what are you doing to bring forward this change? Okay, Hussein, I'd like to come back to you uh, shortly, but I want to get to Gloria first on the question of the flags and the killings and those who lost the limbs. But Gloria, on the question of people getting arrested for protesting, I remember seeing... Uh, the first day, the first day of the Tuesday, uh, droves and droves of people getting picked up and being put, you know, in police vehicles, carted away to police stations. I want to talk to you about this moment, about what does that moment mean legally, and what was the violation with that moment, and why do we keep seeing it? Thank you so much, uh, Alan, for that. And I uh, would like to say that the Law Society of Kenya has, that day, it, it it was a sad day for us because that Tuesday, what happened was uh, we had gone for a memorial for Honorable Monica, who was killed in the hands of the police. And we were called and we were told, we even had not set up the toll-free toll line for people to call advocates, and we were called that there are some advocates who have been arrested and they're in Central Police Station, and we asked ourselves the pertinent question. That time I remember we were with Steve and Tess, and we asked ourselves the question, why are we going to release only lawyers 
while people who have been peacefully demonstrating have been arrested. And I think we had a discussion with the president and she said, yes, let's go bail them out. And I remember when we, when going there, we didn't expect what we, we, we saw on that day. So we went to, to the police station and we actually asked um, to be given the, the list of the people who have been arrested and their charges. And I remember it was a back and forth, back and forth, and now lawyers from certain groups were called, come, let's release these people. And actually when they saw lawyers there, they, they, they saw us as a threat because we are going to release the people who have been causing trouble, uh, quote unquote trouble to them. So when we went there, we tried talking, they tried calling the president and saying, just tell your people to go till 6 p.m. And we asked them, why till 6 p.m. has the law been suspended six, till 6 p.m. that we can only release people after 6 p.m. And when we de demanded to stay with um, the people who have been arrested in the police station, they threw tear gas at us. I remember even one of our council members, Otto, they threw a uh, uh, what is it, a uh, canister, the tear gas canister at her. So the lawyers have been really harassed in this whole process. We saw them the other day in uh, Nanyuki where they had gone to, to actually take, because this guy, I think Lewis, was, they were looking for Lewis and they were harassing him, going to his home, banging his door. And they decided, okay, let's, uh, let's take him to the police station. And when they went, they were all chased away. Lawyers were chased away and they were told, no, we want to speak to Lewis alone. And they said no. And it became a commotion. And they started beating the lawyers and chasing them out of the police station. So uh, what does it mean? It is very lawful, especially for what had been happening in the first uh, terms of the demonstration where people were coming out peacefully. They are just with their water bottles. They are just singing, chanting. And they were not causing any, uh, any kind of fracas. And I think the government had not seen such kind of a thing. They thought everything will be organized, will be uniform, but when they saw large numbers coming and they were wondering how can we contain these numbers because they thought it would just be like the normal ones and by 2 p.m. they are at home or 3 they are at home. So I think um, we need to defend the constitution and we are saying peaceful protesters and that is the case we have seen all through. Peaceful protesters are being arrested, and that is what we are standing uh, standing for. That you cannot just be arrested for exercising your right. Right. Yeah. Uh, to keep up on the space, the the police not only threw tear gas, but they were shooting um, live ammunition, rubber bullets, um, beating up uh, protesters. But most importantly, we also saw police without uniform. Um, completely face covered up, somehow mingling with the protesters and the arrest, shoot and perhaps some of those abductions happen in these moments. I want to ask you about what should the police be doing during protests and what we just went through, just how illegal this whole is and what can we do anything about it or it's just a matter of, well, we reflect and then say, well, that something bad has really happened, we need to move on. So the, the illegalities in terms of policing that we saw in the, over the last month or so did not start then. I think we have to go back to 2023. Uh, we have to go back to 2017. Um, and we have to ask why is it in a point where the state is being challenged on the basis of corruption, on the basis of inequality, on the basis of uh, impunity, um, why does the state respond so violently to peaceful protest? And um, as Amnesty International, we monitored with the Kenya Medical Association and Law Society, and of course many organizations here uh, under the auspices of the police reforms working group and we saw the pattern of policing essentially was to destroy the possibility of a peaceful post protest. How that starts is commanding officers failing to accept letters of notification. The second thing that happens is you arrest anybody you suspect to be an organizer. Now what is a protest organizer? A protest organizer is also a marshal. It is the person who makes sure that when we uh, write a letter to the OC, uh, OCS and we say we are going to move from this point to this point, we are going to approach this government office and we are going to hand over a petition here. 
That is the person that controls the crowds. So once you take those two quick actions, you immediately send a protest into confusion. And we have said this so many times to commanding officers, to the more senior police officers, that as soon as you disrupt that process, you have thrown a peaceful protest into something that is not provided for within Article 37. The second stage is to have police officers coming like criminals, uh, either in balaclavas or without um, identification or with vehicles that have five, um, four or five um, uh, license plates and they embed themselves. They pretend to be protesters in order to arrest protesters or they pretend to be journalists in order to arrest journalists or they tear gas medical officers. This is what we saw this time where we set up pop-up uh, emergency clinics. Essentially, for um, medics, volunteers, not even paid by government, to basically provide treatment, not just to protesters, but to bystanders and also police officers, let's not forget. And what happens is you tear gas them, you arrest people like Brandon, you then seize their medical records so that they can't even follow up with patients. And then the question is for me, is actually who is behaving um, as if this is a riot? Who is providing the riotous activity? Who are the criminals that need to be prosecuted? So to end this point, I think there are many things that we need to do. We need to crowdsource, identify those officers. We need to bring cases against those particular officers individually, plus their commanding officers, to ensure that they are held accountable, not just for the deaths, not just for the injuries that uh, Hussein has spoken about, but even for the violation of the right to protest and the right to express. The previous panel spoke about the horror of having people coming to collect them in the middle of the night. That also needs to be prosecuted because the freedom of expression is what makes us human beings. It is not just that the Constitution protects it, but you are not a human being if you cannot think independently, if you cannot articulate yourself, and if you cannot take action in order to protect a Constitution that we all voted for. Okay, right. So I want to go back to the to the point about, and, and we sort of uh, systematically talk about not just the people, but the role of the flag, as you had brought it up. And my question is this: Who owns the Kenyan flag? Ah, you are Mr. Liraisi Sana. Kenyan flag belongs to the people of Kenya. It's not a government uh, docu uh, item. It's not. It's it's ours. When you talk of black, it's us. It's the color of our skin. When you talk of red, it's the, it's the blood shed. And we continue to shed to this moment, to this very day. And green is our land, you know? So, I mean, I find it absurd for anyone to even imagine or to st tell us that you can't do this. This is a preserve of a few individuals, only the leaders. These are today's Mau Maus. When you are Mekufa, we are seated here today having this conversation here to Fungamano in their honor because they died so that we can be here today. And one thing I want to communicate is that even with the families that we have been going to, you know, you can see that, you know, that resolve and that pride that they have when you go there with the flag and you're draping the flag over the coffin and they say, wow, our son did not die for nothing. He didn't just die like that. He died truly fighting for this country. And when you go to the family and you're handing over the flag, you can actually feel, you know, everyone there holding the mother, the father, the family in pride. So, let it, what's it to teach you? You know, anyone we need to hang. In other countries, people hang these flowers in their backyards. They are there on their the doors. And here we are being told that if you display the flag or if you put it to you, it's an offense. My foot. I mean, we, we can't have that. This is our country. And that is why... That is why we need to reclaim. For me, I'm, I'm a grassroots person. I'm not much of a talker. But you know, everyone, this is the time. Hakuna kitu yenye atuwezi fanya. Hata kama kila mtu anataka ice cream, sayi tunayenda, tunayambia serikali, yo tax, nunulia kila mtu ice cream. I mean, you can't tell us anything. So not just the flag, everything, even the emblem, ukitaka kuva kofia uweke nini, it is yours. So iyo mambo ya kutishana, that fear is gone. When we lose our fear, 
Thank you very much. Gloria, same question. What is this problem with flag and how, how, why do we have this sense of belief, and especially the security forces and the guys who run government, that they own this item exclusively theirs? Sorry? I they didn't. think they own this item. It's a government product. One, we need to remember it's, it's a symbol of, 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 of this country. And uh, if, if it was uh, illegal, I think uh, I'll be the first one in this place. Kushikwa. I have yeah. used it, yes. I have used it uh, as a lesson, but not, mm -hmm. not necessarily, but showing um, my patriotism to this country. We walk around with the bracelets, the Kenyan bracelets, but it has never been a problem. Yeah. Everyone in the, in the UK, you can identify a Kenyan from, from one when you just see that bracelet. But right now, when we are using it at this time, it becomes a problem. Then I think uh, we are not the problem. They are the problem, and I think they should deal with it. And uh, this is just speaking because uh, we, we have had, we, we see people putting uh, the flags on, on their cars. Right now, they are even ashamed of putting those flags in their cars because we will flag them at Tuanguka now. So I think it is not a problem right now. And carrying your flag is, is, is patriotism. They did it uh, very proudly, and now we are the ones saying we, the people, are taking it proudly, and we are carrying our flags, and let them know that we have the power in our hands. And I think one of them, the symbol is our flag. Mm -hmm. The room same question and I will come to, to, to the audience to get some reactions to it and also we are doing this uh, on space and live on NTV as well. So we'll go to that to get your comments and this is our conversation of the room. The same question really about this piece of item, the flag. Let me step back and then come back to the flag. So in a, in a crisis, all nations have three choices. The first is to twist towards constitutionalism. The second is to twist towards authoritarianism. And then the third choice is anarchy. Now what this movement has done has twisted towards constitutionalism. In constitutionalism, there are things that are non-negotiable. One of the non-negotiables is the constitution. That all our actions, all our thoughts are captured in that place that we call a Bill of Rights. And it is clear to me when I saw those crowds marching with constitutions and police officers without a single constitution among them, but with batons, I began to see the righteousness of what was happening on our streets. Consider that in a context where the state wants to disenfranchise you, the first thing it will do is it will tell you there are certain symbols of patriotism, of nationhood, that do not belong to you. The flag does not belong to you. It is okay if you don't take a voter's card, or you lose your ID and don't bother to get another one, or you don't volunteer in a school, clinic, in a school nearby you, or you do not volunteer in a clinic to oversee a public resource that keeps our people safe and dignified or you don't volunteer at all. That is what a state tries to do to remove that section in the Constitution that has expressed itself so loud in the last three weeks, and that is Article 1. If you do not seize this moment, not just as a, I think somebody, I think it was the President who spoke about this, if we do not seek this moment, if we do not uh, grab this moment as a moment for the third liberation, then we are going to squander this moment more generally. So I would say to those cabinet secretaries that are waiting, that are lobbying, and perhaps if they follow the same route that they took in 2027 and 22, that are beginning to put money together to buy a cabinet secretary seat, if they do not come with new ways of working, then consider they have come to reap where they did not sow. And they are coming essentially not to build on this constitutional movement, but to take us back to a place that we did not want to do. So wear your flag. If, if, if necessary, have a flag, uh, have an outfit made from the flag, and let's walk around with underwear, trousers, t-shirts, and jackets. Okay, great. Uh, let's, let's get a reaction from space. Um, I think Masika is online. Masika, could you tell us uh, what your reflections of this protest were, and then I will come to the audience here to get their reflections as well. Thank you, thank you very much. I really appreciate. Um, I hope I'm audible enough. You're great. 
Yeah, so I really appreciate uh, that we are having the Citizen Assembly and um, one of the key things that uh, we note um, clearly is that uh, things have changed, times have changed, we are no longer in the olden days. I was listening that bit uh, on the police and the police upholding the law and um, maybe one of the things that uh, the LSK can be helping us to know because I think the police are enforcing the law but they don't know the law because when you ask a police officer why they are arresting you some of them clearly do not know even the procedure of arresting whether you're a criminal or a, suspe a suspect or something like that do they have it in their curriculum because these guys go um, to for in the training camps to do martial arts to do a work on how to use buttons to beat up people but when you ask a police officer uh, to uphold the law when they are arresting you do they have the knowledge of applying that law so for me that has been a question because the problem with the police begins at the time of recruitment because you look at even the people that the the, the, the recruiters are looking for then you clearly know that is where the the rain starts beating us me personally i did very well in uh, all level and i wanted to join the police but i was removed from the line because i was told that i needed to go to university and study but i needed to become a police officer whether i started as a serviceman and then later on be promoted but they refused because of my grade in in form four so one of the things that we need to push even as uh, right now because our voices are being heard and this is how it's going to be can we have anybody even if i got an a in form four and i want to become a police officer i be allowed to become a police officer at whatever level i'm beginning because we have graduates who got a's and they do not have jobs and they're doing border border work so if I, I i am i i got an a and i want to become a police officer they should allow me to join the forces because one of the things that we are battling with is some of the guys that are I'm not saying that if you scored less in Form 4, you don't have brains, but clearly, the most of the people that we meet in the police and they are arresting you, you can clearly tell that they do not even have the, 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 the ability to engage with you and tell you uh, why they are arresting you. They just come using muscles and power. So, one, I, I think the police do not have the knowledge of the same law they follow. They follow, they follow only commands that they are given. So, when you say you are doing a uh, peaceful demonstration according to article 37 and you're not dis destroying any property is that police officer who is arresting you aware that there's such article 37 in the constitution because that is where the rain be begins uh, beating us can we have the law part of the the, the law trained uh, to the police officers who enforce the law and then arrest i want to think arrest should be done should be done at the open and somebody should be notified because we are having abductions and the police are picking people from the street and their homes can we have a, if you arrest me please allow me to notify my family members that you have arrested me and where are you taking me so um I, as i finish on that police thing i think the failure of the police starts at the place where you're recruiting them and it also uh, continues because of the curriculum uh, they use to train the police officers and then when i come on the and the third thing the flag is is the, a national or national symbol the same way we sing national anthems uh, I, I have a national anthem on my phone as the ringtone why am i not being questioned it's it, it, the constitution i think is uh, article 9 just says national symbols it says the coat of arms the national anthem the flag it is patriotism for me to put on uh, like somebody saying i can even do an underwear showing um, the national flag it is the love of my country and the symbols that represent my country so I think on the flag thing, um, it, it's an intrusion. We can use the flag in whichever way, as long as we are not disrespecting it. We are, we, we're just using it to show the love that we have thank for the you. country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. thank you very much. I need to hand over the microphone to one person next, then I come back here. Uh, Sylvia Ngati. Uh, Sylvia, if you can take one minute and give us your reflection as well. Do I still have Sylvia? All right. Meanwhile, let me just give the gentleman here the background. Please say your name to stand up. Uh, say your name and tell us what your reflections are. Thank you very much. Uh, comrades power. Power. And I want us to do it a little differently. When I say people power, you say our power. People power. 
People power. power. Our power. Our power. People power. I want to make quick reflections. My name is Musila John Moisio, and I coordinate a social movement. This is the activista movement. But I'm equally a member of the Kibera Social Justice Center. And there is a panel that came just before your panel, and these guys were speaking there, Billy, Nadia, and the other. And all they did before was to be on social media. They just used to tweet on, on things that pleases them. And for the first time being on social media, attracted problems to them, that they were abducted and all that. And I wanted to ask them a question, and I think I still need to ask a question to the room. Would they have seen themselves in a state that they've seen themselves, found themselves now? And the obvious answer could have been no. If it were me or Apio Lal and a few others, being arrested today will not be a scare to us because we've been on the streets a number of times. Some of us have been arrested and all that. What has really happened with this movement it has redefined what human rights defense is. This is not a career. Human rights defense is everyone's call to be an active citizen and demand service, demand accountability from its government. And so when I see young people today, every day spending every second on social media to just speak on issues of accountability from their government, I am so elated because it is no longer about a few held the title human rights defense but before i sit down i want to make another just quick reflection we've seen just the other day that the opposition joined the president to try and protect their interest in 1975 before jm karaoke was killed he made a very simple statement that kenya had become a country of 10 millionaires and 10 million beggars now today the beggars have united against the millionaires of this country. And all they are saying, enough of you taking advantage of us. And it started very simply by rejecting the finance bill. So my last statement, smart as I sit down. The framers of the Constitution 2010, and I will read because I have posted it on my Twitter, said but a few things. That the greatest threat to liberty in Kenya is an all-powerful central government where only a few dictate the many we've seen what the president has done in even curtailing the powers of our national assembly our legislature which is a separate wing of government that should be holding this same executive to account and this is because he is taking us back to an all-powerful central government which the constitution actually is against. But they were equally very cautious to realize that the rule of the mob, which is unguided at times, will lead to anarchy and, in the end, despotism. I know as a country that respects its constitution, we will it want to get there. So as we've been pushing, we are equally very cautious not to allow anyone an excuse to say I turned this country into a military state because the mob did not want to be guided. I turned this country into a dictatorship because the mob insisted into it. So we are pushing, demanding for good governance, demanding for accountability. We are not relenting because as always, people power is greater than the people in power. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just give the microphone to the gentleman on a suit at the back. Thank you. Viva Comrade Viva. Viva. Amandla. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, Comrade, I just have uh, uh, an observation in form of a question that of course we are doing well in the national government. But there's a group of people who are really devolved and in touch with our people or the proletariats in the villages back in the counties. I was saying that, comrades, let's not forget the counties. That is the people who are also interacting with our people back there in the villages. So after this struggle comes from the national, we go back to the county government so that we fight this nepotism and fight for transparency and accountability. I want specifically to appreciate Aki Africa. I was there, smart, I'm traumatized up to date. This guy is so quiet, I don't know what he's using, I'm shocked. 
They took me to a mutuary. I ran away with this gentleman during Rex and Evans postmortem. I don't know you are made of what. All those parents were crying on their chests. I was shocked to see them still walking. I was shocked on the hardest day of the strike. You know, on Thursday, few people came. They, they were among the few who came, and Shakira and the rest. Now, to, to notify us and to get us very, very easy on Thursday. I remember those guys were going to an extent of tear gassing where people were being treated. You are just wondering, what kind of human being is this? This is a place where people are now being treated, please. And they even going ahead to tear gas a petrol station. We are at the corner of the total there. It was quite unfortunate. Please, comrades, the question I wanted to ask with care and with utmost humility, how can you organize this struggle in a way that we don't lose the gains made and we don't lose the focus? Because if we end up in the morning, someone is saying we fight for this, fight for that, fight for this, fight for positions, then we are going to lose this focus and these guys are going to run away with all the gains that we have done what we have made. So I was just pleading with the, those in the panel, if you can guide the conversation to a clear focus. Because now there are also political rivals who are taking advantage of this thing. Like someone is planning to buy for 2027. What is the next thing? 20 to Salami and Ani. You are getting. Not for the struggle, but for the narrow self-seeking interest. That was my plea. Otherwise, Aki Africa, may God bless you. And I'm pleading colleagues who are seated there. How can you be brief? I'm a teacher by profession. Some people came for the struggle, didn't even know the road. I was shocked someone asking me, I'm a fika ngara and wapi barabara kuenda kabete. You can tell you. When we are taking that roundabout to Nyayo, wale leangusha fence, those who are falling down, wale leona, they are still, I still feel the smell of blood mpaka saizi. So how can we debrief these people by cancelling them? Because some people may also turn violent after this one. Because someone, wengine wako mezoa that kind of exposure. I remember one girl and he took a tuny woman to a cancer pig a kelele and do what you can fought. What you can fought a tuny woman to become a possessed. So, how can you also organize that we have centers, we communicate where these people can come and we get guidance and counseling? May God bless the struggle. Thank you. Uh, can, 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 can you take your brief as well and, and, and keep it a minute or less? Yes, I'll make it very brief. Um, comrades, power. Comrades power. Now, I want us to trace the bullet that was in David Chagia's head. Back to the trigger, to the magazine, to the command, Adamson Bougay, to Jafeth Kome, and we make it very clear where the accountability stops. My point is this. The person who is ultimately responsible for all the death, the destruction, is the president. Okay? Let's not make excuses. Let's not say the police, the police, the police. They are individually culpable. But ultimately, it's the president who takes responsibility. Ruto must go. Ruto must go. As I finish, I think the problem we have, and I'll put this to the panel, I think we have a country that is lacking ideology. And please, civil society, help us define the, the ideology for this revolution. Because we have inherited a system, colonial government, and governments after, where governance is about brutality, repression, plunder, and pillage. So can we have an ideology moving forward so that when we fight, when we occupy spaces, we're occupying spaces knowing the Kenya that we are fighting for is defined by this set, certain set of values. Others without values will get back, certain politicians will come back, and we'll have the same you know, battle over and over again. Thank you. Ruto must go. All right. Can I, can I get ladies in the room, please? Uh, so bring the microphone to the front. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's good afternoon. I I think. Um, my name is Miana. I'm a forensics uh, specialist. I've had the privilege of working for government, working outside of government, and now I work as a consultant, and I'm sure Hussein is laughing because he knows there's a place we met. Um, I have a question, slightly, okay, I, the two issues. He brought up a forensic issue, but uh, my question, I, I I think it's just an issue of reflection. Um, since the start of the, the, the protests, I've been wondering 
And when I go into every office, I see the picture of the president. I don't mean any disrespect, but is that also a symbol of, uh, that is compulsory? You understand, like, I wonder why I don't see the picture, a framed beautiful picture of the Constitution of Kenya, of the preamble signed by the Kibaki. I mean, that is what we give the president to uphold. That is his custodianship in terms of mandate when you are a president. So um, I, I think we have to do away with the frills, with that kind of you know, um, self-aggrandizement, uh, idolatry somewhat, because it's also, you know, it's behavior modification. You keep seeing this image, and instead of seeing the Constitution, instead of seeing our, the, the, the rules by which we want to govern ourselves as a society, we see a person. And so none of us can get away with seeing this person, either at national government level, offices, public offices, private sector offices, county governments. I, I think it's time for us to put, um, the, the, to put the symbols of power by the people where they should be, and, and the symbols that need to, need to be transitioned out, as my dear um, uh, comrade has said, you know, is then moved towards what's the ide ideology of this revolution. Um, I would say we need accountable governance. We don't just need governance, we have governance. We try to use elections to eliminate people. You know, I would say this, then eliminate them out of the competition. We use, elections have been used to vote people out, but we don't vote in the person we want because we don't see the person we want. We're just left with two choices and we choose the lesser, you know, I don't want to say it. Someone said the other day that uh, uh, my babas were Eve. You know, so um, we, you know we 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 can't do that anymore. And we, I mean, when I think about all these things, I'm just like, this country is a beautiful country. We have, with everything that has happened, we are here. We are a regional power. We are respected, and we need to move forward from that. But we are now stuck because. There is no accountable governance mechanisms in every agency of government, parastatals, sagas, you know, and we are, our priorities are just simply upside down and 